COVID-19, we are providing opportunity to all of our students to listen to Professor Manta. And on behalf of uh, Dr. D.Y. Patil with the PIT, uh, all the trustees and honorable chancellors, as well as all my faculty members and colleagues, I extend warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, for the for the uh, information and just to update, since you know DPU very well, Dr. D.Y. Patil, it is known to you. Did you know that in the recent uh, NIRF ranking, uh, Dr. D.Y. Patil Vidyapeet has been in the top 50 universities across India, out of uh, 5,800 uh, different participants. And uh, we are at a position number 46. Similarly, I'm very proud to say that uh, our dental college is in the top three. It's placed at uh, number three at the national level. And this is a proud feeling for uh, all of us. And I uh, also wish to inform you that our medical college is in the top 25 medical colleges. It is at the position number 24. And therefore, these are the achievements, which are recent achievements, which are made by uh, DPU fraternity. And therefore, we happy to inform you and update you with regard to these achievements as such. Now, for the benefit of uh, the students and faculty members, let me also take the uh, opportunity of uh, introducing our guest, uh, Professor Dr. S.S. Mantha, who is a former chairman of the uh, All India Institute of uh, uh, Technical Education, AICT, New Delhi. And uh, during his tenure, uh, there is a remarkable change that has taken place at the AICT level, Delhi, in terms of e-governance initiatives, as well as uh, in terms of uh, seeing that uh, several different disciplines, they get connected uh, with AICT in different areas, which are emerging areas like uh, robotics, uh, then control theory, then AI, and uh, so many others. And therefore, uh, currently, uh, Professor uh, Manta is uh, occupying uh, the chair, which is an emer emeritus chair. He has more than 280 publications in national and international journals and conferences, besides uh, authoring several books. And therefore, presently, uh, if you see his profile, he is a, a chancellor of uh, Kale University and adjunct professor at the National Institute for Advanced Studies, NIAS Bangalore. He is also chairman of uh, technical committee of uh, National Cyber Safety and Security Standards, that is NCSSS, and uh, IT expert for government of Maharashtra. I'm sure that this experience and expertise that uh, Professor Manta has, today's uh, address to all the faculty members and students will certainly be very uh, rewarding experience for all of them. And therefore, it is indeed a great pleasure to welcome Professor Manta on behalf of all DPU fraternity, on behalf of Honorable Chancellor, as well as all the trustees and all my faculty members. Sir, we extend you very warm welcome for this particular uh, webinar and we look forward for hearing you. Thank you very much. Once again, uh, we welcome you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning to uh, all of you and uh, the participating faculty, the students, and so on. Uh, I'll be sharing my uh, screen so that uh, we can go through a, a small uh, presentation uh, that will highlight the issues currently uh, to be addressed. We are more challenges in higher education uh, during and post uh, COVID-19, uh, the, the pandemic that we have. 
like every like every uh, business that is disrupted, even education has been disrupted, and therefore we need to really look at uh, the solutions that are available to us uh, in terms of keeping the uh, education going from a student's perspective, so that they don't lose time and they don't lose the interest in pursuing further studies. Now here, what we have is, uh, we, all, we all understand the spirit of education, ano badra kritavo yantu vishwataha, which means let noble thoughts come to us from every side. Now that's the spirit of education, and therefore this activity must go on in everybody's life and at whatever stage people are in. So this, this should become the guiding principle for education in our country. Now there is a preamble to what I'm doing like for example, pandemics will always change the way we live and we must be innovative in, enough to overcome them. 100 years back also we had a pandemic and very recently in 2003-04 also we had a pandemic that was SARS and we did overcome that. There was a huge loss at that time as well, both, both economy and several other uh, sectors of economy. Europe, like now, was also the most affected at that time. Education, like other businesses, has also been disrupted, like I said. And we cannot afford to see that this disruption has a lasting influence on our lives. So we need new innovative ways to reach out to the students. There are several intuitive ways which are suggesting that online education is an alternative. Several institutions have tried that, have done that fairly successfully. Some of the institutions are struggling to do that and so on. Amongst higher education, there are several facets. Engineering is one of them, is an applied science. And we all realize that Applied sciences, not everything can be virtual or not everything can be uh, online. So they, we need to work out some blended system, some hybrid system which combines face-to-face -face and online education so that the hands-on skills or the competency-based skills do not suffer. There are other facets of higher education like art, science, commerce, and so on. They too need hybrid and blended learning, which mixes traditional institutional attendance with laboratory and home instruction. There are several assignments that are given, home instructions which are given, which actually become the handholding. And at a certain point of time, the faculty would come, handhold the people in an interactive session. And that's how the entire uh, paradigm of learning progresses. We have a very robust higher education system with almost 1,000 universities, 45,000 colleges. They stood the test of times, though we all know that it never reached everyone. Education for all is something that we have been talking about, but probably never reached everyone. The higher education GER is just about 25, which means effectively out of every 100, there are 75 students who are not probably going to college, either because financially they cannot do it, or maybe they are not interested in the current learning that is happening within the colleges. Whatever be the reason, a GER of 25 for a developing nation, for a developed nation, is very, very low. So therefore, alternatives here again suggest that online education is a means of reaching almost everyone 
who is unreached today. And currently the pandemic has disrupted both segments. It has disrupted the people who are in the college and those who are outside the college. So therefore we must look at what is the best way possible. There are two problems in this. One is more immediate and the second one is long term. Now what is immediate? In the immediate time, we need to complete the unfinished curriculum. The pandemic hit us sometime in the middle of March and many institutions were closed effectively after that and they are yet to open. The students in most of the residential campuses left the campus, they went back home and therefore the curriculum remained unfinished. About 60 to 70 percent of the curriculum was completed at that point of time and the best option was to aggregate all the good online content from various MOOCs platforms both in the public and the private domain and make it available to students online so that they can study from home which was what practiced by most of the institutions universities and so on but many of them also could not or did not get into the online mode which means that a large section of students have been left high and dry because of whatever the pressures, the outside pressures and the inability to go online and use the platforms effectively. Some of the online content providers like Coursera and many others are giving the content free to the students and faculty at least till end of July so that the education part the learning part doesn't get affected now the un universities and institutions should have used that and some of them like i said did use it effectively however there is a problem not everyone is very seamlessly aligned to online education or receiving education online and therefore faculty must handhold and most of this content is in the form of small uh, nano kind of uh, uh, modules which are put together to form the entire curriculum. So typically there are five hour modules, 10 hour modules and so on. And as we know, the curriculum has maybe a single course has three to four credits, which means uh, 45 to 60 hours in a semester. Now, therefore, what is effectively needed to be done is to pick up those smaller modules out of these content pro providers and align it to the curriculum and make it equivalent to what is being taught in the classroom. Now, this aligning may be a little problematic in the sense that there are so many options and so many titles available and so on. There are learning, the, most of the learning platforms, which I'll come to a little later, they also provide machine learning algorithms to align the, the modules, the course modules to the curriculum. So these things must be explored in terms of technology. And then we can have curriculum, which is completely aligned, aligned to uh, what, the, uh, what the content must be. So, they also can be integrated with learning management platforms. There are several of them available. Moodle in the open source, Canvas, Blackboard, or similar. Some of the universities are actually using these learning management platforms so that the student and faculty data analytics is also available. And this helps. In, uh, this helps in uh, personalized learning, which is an important part of online learning. Now, personalized learning is something that will uh, feature more and more in times to come. Uh, online education and data analytics, they allow you a possibility of, uh, of addressing the requirements of each student and also addressing the way he learns. So therefore, online education technically can become 
uh, customized from a student's perspective. So that's personalized learning, which is extremely important. And, in all, and also in time to come, we may not really see the traditional degrees, your uh, BSc, BCom, BA, and things like that, maybe not in that form, but a lot of choice will be available to the students to design their own content and uh, get onto degrees which uh, probably make more sense to them and from an employ employment uh, perspective. Now, there are several other uh, problem areas, challenges, like conduct of examinations and, and so on. First of all, conduct of examinations as we uh, know them in the unfinished uh, uh, semester and also what should be done in, in a long-term perspective. The national accreditation agencies such as NAC and NBA, they stress a great deal on continuous assessments to evaluate student outcomes. Uh, also in line with what the global accreditation systems uh, speak about. And we also know that accreditation is mandatory in our institutions. Now combining both these, uh, every institution must have gone through continuous assessments and uh, credits must have been given and so on. Now, what one can possibly do is pick up those continuous assessments of every student, convert them to credits and assign an equivalent credit to the previous two semesters. And therefore, combining these three units together, these three parts together, you can have, you can complete the assessment for the com current year. You can create a template for every student on that basis and substitute that with the year-end uh, paper-based examinations. So that uh, would be an effective way of looking at it. And there is something that the examinations must be conducted and we will wait endlessly to do that. That's not uh, possible. And it will only delay the next semester uh, to be started in uh, time. Now, if a certain examination will is still to be conducted, an objective type online examinations uh, can still be done. Uh, that is generated from AI-based question generators. We have several of them. One example is Quillions, which allows you to pick up keywords and key sentences and so on, and uh, creates questions randomly and they can be distributed on a, on a particular topic. They can be distributed randomly to the student community. And can, that can take care of the final year examinations. In fact, online assessment would declare the results also instantaneously. And therefore, this partly uh, uh, come, comes across as the solution for the current semester or the current year students. Now, uh, we all know that everything from student learning assessment to entry level candidate assessment can be done online with smart classrooms and learning management systems. Uh, it is now easier for teachers to conduct interactive learning sessions. A student, teachers, faculty can come down at certain specific times when the online content is on. They can handhold, they can do some interactive sessions, you know, and uh, take questions on a chat basis and reply them, map students' knowledge and create progress reports. Now, all this is possible and possibly Deva Patel University also must be doing it in some uh, way. Online examinations are conducted on web-enabled devices. We all know like laptops, desk computers, and so on, and even a smartphone uh, support is workable. Now, question paper formation, online examinations, multilingual support, page navigations, time management, work management, and in order to book slots for students from a student's perspective, a certain time to give an examination, certain time to learn, things like that. SMS, email alerts, e-haul tickets, payment gateway support, result processing features, auto grading, and instant score generation, they're all possible through commercial platforms that are available in order to conduct examinations online. Now, 
people also question the authenticity of a student taking an online examination now how do we address that people often ask questions as to uh, what happens if uh, there is a proxy who is taking examination or things and and so on proving authenticity should not really be a problem in 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 terms of technology that is available where a webcam will pick up the profile students appearing for the exam are verified using biometrics based authentication features most of the service providers they do provide even today use a biometrics data that includes fingerprint face recognition palm print hand geometry iris recognition and retina recognition they also provide remote proctoring during the examinations which is an extremely useful uh, tool so even assigning staff members for invigilation may be dispensed uh, with so the whole process happens automatically or what we term automation in education now we have seen some short term uh, challenges and some short term uh, uh, solutions uh, now in the long term what do we really need to do uh, this this uh, uh, covid 19 is probably uh, not going to go away any time soon uh, we all know the peak has not even uh, reached in in our country and therefore things are still rising and probably somewhere you know it has to uh, uh, reduce and then uh, come down and plateau off and things like that and all that will take considerable amount of time so therefore the next semester will most certainly be uh, will have to be conducted online and the examinations everything moves online and some uh, face to face will still happen in when you need competency based based skills to be to be imparted and assessed so in the long term we need to uh, consciously uh, uh, decide on implementing blended learning partly face to face and partly online now when we do this there are several questions like what happens to credits the online has a, di a different it's a different mode of uh, learning will the credits be same as face to face and so on now the simple idea is uh, the mode may be different but the learning is still the same so all courses must be credited when done online or offline similarly so there can certainly be a debate on what is the percentage of face to face what is the percentage of online a 70 30 could be a good starting point and uh, probably increase over a period of time now continuous assessment appropriately credited must eventually replace the year end semester and examinations because what you have uh, i mean if there is an honest introspection we will understand that the online the uh, the year end uh, examination or semester end examination they just uh, check the how, how much the uh, student probably would, uh, would uh, remember and, and things like that to uh, look at an option of completely dispensing with this year end examinations online examinations move over to come Uh, continuous assessment uh, and uh, appropriately credited now when i say blended learning there are several models uh, of blended learning available and like we like i've been saying part of uh, the learning is face to face and part of the learning is online and uh, some of the other uh, uh, definitions for blended learning is uh, people would uh, probably say Uh, in a classroom i'll use uh, you know models i'll use online content and so on so as as, as a part of assisted uh, learning uh, so there are different there are several models for uh, blended learning as well in uh, the main there are four uh, models rotation flex a la carte uh, and uh, enriched virtual now most of these models they are Uh, they get their uh, definition based on how the interaction happens between the student and the faculty or uh, how the interaction happens between a group of students and the faculty so therefore uh, a rotation model would in typically in computer science uh, the students rotate on a fixed schedule or at the teacher's discretion between learning mod modalities at least uh, one of which in that modalities is online learning 
there are several other modalities like small group full instruction full class instruction there are group projects there is there is individual tutoring there is a pencil and paper assignment and so on now here uh, most of the learning happens in the brick and mortar campus except for the homework assignments now in the station rotation uh, model there is a lab rotation model there is a flipped classroom where what happens within the classroom is sort to be taught outside and what happens outside the classroom like learning that happens outside the classroom is into brought into the classroom so therefore basically the definition would revolve around the way we conduct uh, teaching learning uh, in terms of students and in terms of uh, the interaction that the student have with the environment in the flex model in the flexible model the course of subject in which online learning is the backbone of student learning even if it direct direct students to offline activities at times and students move on an individually customized uh, schedule among learning modalities so there is a lot of flexibility that is available for the student he can choose and pick and choose and uh, and so on the data analytics support obviously comes from the uh, learning management uh, systems in an a la carte model the student can pick and choose uh, the modules that he wants to learn at the time that he wants to learn and so on in an enriched virtual model there there are a lot of uh, ar vr uh, devices which are used the augmented reality the virtual reality models which are used to uh, get across uh, to the uh, students now first of all why do we really need our the online or blended learning have you seen what is blended learning now first of all this is useful from two perspectives first they blur the lines around what we consider a college the other making it much easier for families to get high quality materials and instruction for the children in a wide range of subjects it breaks the barriers between a college uh, going student and a non college going uh, student now that's the biggest advantage of uh, online learning and the second is it get, it gets a lot of good content right into your drawing rooms and a transparent if efficient effective responsive agile which means keeps changing as the situation demands innovative and focused decision making is however needed in order that these things are successful in a institution now there are several changing trends of educational digital content and we must be aware of what is available in the market and how do we uh, use that uh, in an institution in a university the, the digital content must be interactive for sure there must be a lot of interaction possible between the student the learner the uh, the, the teacher and and so on in fact uh, we must understand that the role of a teacher is no longer that of pure teaching but the teacher becomes a guide and a mentor in the new uh paradigm and, and not just a teacher so therefore this must be interactive it must be characteristic which means every content must be characteristically different and holds on to its own uh, points of advantage and so on which which means the uh, the content must be uh, mobile based which must be available on a smartphone your students must be able to learn from anywhere and so on must be global which means the content must have a value that is uh, that is credible enough to be used anywhere in the world it must be realistic there must be uh, augmented reality virtual reality uh, capabilities built into the online or the uh, the content that uh, is available and there must be an emotional connect between the content and the uh and this uh, learners so these are the changes of uh, changing trends of educational digital content now having said that let's see what considerations for success for future education uh, must be made the uh, education a successful digital learning must have easy access through various devices 
whatever device I am using, the content must be portable on that, must be available on that, and I should be able to learn on that. Now, uh, which means that I cannot design something only that, that will run on a laptop or only on a mobile and so on. Big data management for learning analytics is extremely important because now in an online media, there will be the number of students doesn't uh, create a limitation. So there are several number of students. And once we talk of several students, there could be uh, students who are slow learners, there could be students who are fast learners, and uh, there could be students who want learning to be done in a certain uh, manner and uh, so on. So therefore, a lot of data analytics is important and, and which means that these learning management systems, they, they create a uh, lot of data and uh, which will require big data management and learning analytics in order to create that personalized concept around every single uh, student. What is blending of online and offline content? How, how seamlessly can we blend the face-to-face uh, -face learning with online content? Now, that's extremely important from uh, a digital learning perspective. Now, various digital content sharing and collaboration must happen. You may have content available in different sources, different places, and so on. And how easy or difficult it is to bring uh, at a certain time uh, content from different sources and share that and co collaborate with people uh, in order to make a uh, something like experiential learning happen. Then you have training for teacher computer and competency development. Most of this is involved around digital uh, tools, using digital tools and learning uh, management systems and so on. So therefore, there, there must be a lot of training that is available and uh, training would actually uh, decide how we are uh, going to use uh, this service. Now, the fi finally, we also need service quality assurance. Like in the early days, we were talking about an accreditation system or a quality metric that was based on, op uh, on open loop system, which means you provide all the inputs that are required, which makes quality and which defines quality. And then we go through the processes and expect that the quality would be there. We don't have any means of measuring that quality in an open loop system. Now, we have moved out from that and we are into almost a closed loop system where you, if you look at your curriculum, the development of your curriculum, you write pro program outcomes, you write course outcomes and so on. And there, when the peer team comes uh, visiting your institution, they check for the validity of those program outcomes, the validity of those course outcomes in, in terms of how much of that has been met from a student's perspective, from a faculty's perspective, and on that. So there is some way of knowing if I give so much, so much of input into uh, to this process of education, then is there a way of measuring those uh, parameters which I call as outcomes? Now that partly happens in current uh, day system and in future, this will move to completely adaptive based uh, learning systems, which means that uh, you in the entire education supply chain, there are several elements and each element has certain input and certain outcomes. And therefore, can we measure each element as an entity and uh, measure its uh, outcomes and correct the entity and not transfer the, uh, the error part to every single uh, element and so on. In future, we will also look at quality assurance systems, which is in a way you guarantee uh, the uh, outcomes that we're talking about to a student. Now, from a, from a different perspective, a guarantee means the user, the consumer, can actually sue you if you don't deliver on the outcomes. Now, this is exactly happening in, in the uh, case study which is currently available to us in the uh, state of uh, South Carolina. There are at least three universities which have filed a class action suit, which have the students have filed class action suits against those universities. And two of their points was uh, were uh, the, the first one is, uh, uh, you have promised us uh, face-to-face education, 
and suddenly since march we have moved into online education and uh, uh, the online education uh, doesn't need uh, the kind of uh, fee that you have charged uh, us during uh, promising as a face to face learning suit that has been filed and the second one is uh, uh, that the world over it is believed that the online uh, the credits that are accrued uh, from an online education are uh, lesser than the credits that I accrued through face to face education and there again there is a quality deficiency uh, that the universities have promised and what uh, they have delivered so these kind of assurance metrics will have to be properly designed and implemented with uh, passion. Now, when we talk about open online courses, there are several concepts that are that we must understand. The first is X MOOCs, which means uh, the most common uh, type of uh, MOOC organized around the central professor and a core curriculum. We also have C MOOCs, which uh, talks about connectivity in MOOCs. It resembles a graduate seminar course for student discussions with the core of learning coming from student to student interactions. There is also DOCC, the distributed online collaborative course in which the same course, core courses material is distributed to students at multiple institutions, but the exact administrators of the material can uh, vary. So the handholding persons can vary, the, uh, the mentors can vary, the facilitators can vary, and so on. Big open online uh, course, which is similar to MOOCs, but limited to smaller number of students, typically 50. There is also a synchronous massive online course where the lectures are broadcast live, requiring students to log in at specific times in order to hear the lectures. We also have a small private online course, which is similar to MOOCs, but the student teacher interaction is most, more closely modeled after traditional classrooms and uh, NOOCs or nano open online courses, which, which most of the content providers use. They are meant to empower learners to learn on the essentials of one competency skill or area of knowledge at a time with 20 learning hours or less, depending upon one's preferences and abilities. Now, what does that mean? See, a, a synchronous learner, it's extremely difficult to keep his attention uh, to the content uh, that somebody is teaching somewhere where there's no connect between the teacher and the learner. The, if, the, if the content is not interesting, the other side, the fellow may switch off or uh, do something else and not concentrate on what is happening on the screen. So therefore, in order to uh, keep the interest going, two things must happen. One is the modules must be very, very small. The content, uh, if I have a four credit program, which uh, uh, in a traditional classroom is 60 hour duration, I cannot have one hour uh, lectures like uh, they happen in a classroom 60 times in a semester and then expect the student to learn in an asynchronous uh, mode. Even that one hour will have to be uh, all the models and, and uh, a kind of interaction must be built into it. For example, build questions, build expect answers from the student. There must be an interaction that closely monitors what the learning that is happening. So these uh, small, so the entire content, whether it's Coursera or Redex or Udemy or whoever, they create content of very small uh, uh, time uh, modules so that the interaction is much better. Now, having said that, there is, uh, in order that uh, all these things uh, happen um, seamlessly, we need learning management systems. So you need learning, for example, uh, somebody has to deliver, somebody has to learn, there must be a management because uh, the student time has to be managed, the faculty time has to be managed, and the schedules have to be managed, and so on. And uh, there must be an e-platform. All these things, three things coming together is a learning management uh, system. So it's basically designed to help an individual develop, manage, you know, and provide online courses and programs to learn. Now, learning must be fun. Like, like we, learning cannot be boring. It must be fun. And therefore, there is a concept called gamification. Like you have, you play games, you play video games and you play them very, and they're very, very interesting. Now the idea is, can we convert uh, the entire learning activity like we play a video game? Now that is the gamification and it's a billion, billion dollar uh, activity that's happening all over the world 
and probably in times to come we will see much more of that happening now having uh, said that we are using moocs as an aggregator in the value network now can what is this moocs as an aggregator in this and what is that value network that we are talking about in future look at the paradigm that i am uh, trying to uh, come out with i i have a university i have an engineering discipline or i have a medicine, medical discipline uh, medicine as a discipline and i have several other disciplines and there are like me there are 10 other universities which are doing the same thing should we really come out and say that you develop your own content or i'll use a content from a third party source you use your own content and 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 so on and duplicate the entire effort why should we Uh, really be doing this can we use moocs as an aggregator which brings all these universities together and provide uh, the uh, you know uh, options of uh, uh, subscribing to a good uh, content uh, provider uh, on a on a shared uh, basis so you have uh, the on one side you have regulators professional bodies you have advertisers and sponsors on the other side and on that on the other side you have uh the value uh, network so you have customers as students you have customers as employers and you, you have value uh, in return for an introductory introductory fee so moocs can act as an aggregator in bringing these these different players together and create a system of virtualization of uh, the entire education uh, space which which is actually a virtual university which will uh, look at uh, a little later now there are there is a rise in technology enabled uh, uh, you know uh, the rise in technology enabled interactive platforms to promote learning process for uh, students as we all know the covid 19 has changed the entire uh, landscape of learning individual uh, and today we i mean even before the pandemic happened we saw uh, individuals learn in airline queues they are standing in queues and they are looking at mobile learning uh, some Uh, you know concept and so on they are they are uh, learning in cafes uh, watching a new video tutorial they were they learning in subways they are learning in buses uh, they are playing a game and then learning uh, a new process all this is happening which means in simply that learning landscape is changing and the systems that we have built also must change uh, must uh, change and handhold those processes there is a growing need for micro learning like i said before short relevant contextualized personalized core courses must be available on mobile devices on any device uh, that a student would uh, probably have uh, there is a there is a actually an explosion of growth in uh, mobile learning smartphones and mobile devices for consumption and delivering interactive and engaging content of uh, learning so a smartphone it can toggle as a laptop for uh, certain applications and uh, the online learning can be a extremely good uh, uh, medium uh, for uh, now there is also a rise of real world learning the uh, real in the real world we have we only we do not have only learning we also have fun so therefore learning must be engaging and fun so therefore you uh, one can uh, do the learning by uh, by integrating the ar devices the vr devices into a lms so that they can be accessed uh, with ease now ar is an augmented uh, reality vr is a virtual reality and that is where the success of gamification happens you you build the modules the learning modules uh like you play a game uh, so therefore the uh, the people would uh, participate in interactively and when the questions come uh, like they come in uh, while you play a game if you if you have uh, played uh, the most uh, sort after game pokemon uh, go you will understand what i am really uh, getting at uh, now increasing collaboration with social social learning is another important aspect aspect that will continue to happen uh, no longer it's it's a teacher delivering and student learning but a lot of collaboration that will happen in uh, time to come uh, 
collaboration may happen with parents, may happen with uh, siblings, may happen with peers, may happen with friends, with employees, anything. Collaboration is a mainstream tool to engage employees, enable smart uh, decision making, and enhance uh, business outcomes. They can also be equally effective in uh, learning uh, new concepts. Now, here I have uh, some commercially available uh, uh, learning management systems like Talent MS, uh, which is a cloud hosted open API uh, platform. Moodle, again, is on premise. Edmodo is a cloud hosted uh, platform. Blackboard is a, again a cloud hosted uh, platform. Schoology is an open API and cloud hosted platform. The numbers on the right indicate the number of students who are currently logged in onto these uh, platforms. So uh, a lot of uh, changes are happening around us. And if you do not accept the change, there'll be a time when change will uh, be all over us and we may not be able to accept that. Now there are several MOOC uh, platforms available. These are also light learning management systems. Swayam is one, which is Government of India initiative. There is edX courses are interesting, but can be quite challenging because of the way they have been designed. Coursera offers more than 4,000 courses of more than 200 universities. And best of the faculty around the world, they, uh, their content is available. And uh, they also come down to handhold and so on. Khan Academy, some of you must be going. Academy has content practically on everything under the uh, under the sun. Uh, Canvas, Future Learn, Udacity, all those uh, management uh, content uh, management systems and uh, uh, and so on. Now we use a typical content portal and uh, learning management systems in order to integrate with the larger ERP uh, systems that are running in within the organization, we also may need a content, a typical content management system or a powerful, flexible editor, uh, like uh, what you see is what you get kind of uh, systems where editor is critical. So if you can make sure you're comfortable making changes within the content management software uh, tools. So these allow a much better learning experience from a student's perspective. Now, ability to test. You need to be able to easily run tests on outcomes. It's not enough to provide a lot of platforms and so on. It's also necessary to conduct run tests and find out how effective these uh, things uh, really are. Now, there are several uh, professional, uh, come, uh, professionally available uh, content management systems like HubSpot, Squarespace, Wix, and WordPress, which can be used uh, for these uh, services. Now, there are some more long-term changes that we uh, really uh, should look at. The entire education ecosystem will need to transform into a facilitating student-centric paradigm, unlike the current faculty-centric paradigm. No longer it's a one-way traffic between the faculty and the, and the student. It has to become a engaging uh, learning uh, paradigm between faculty and the student. So the student, the teacher's role must transform into uh, a guide and a mentor and no longer as someone who keeps talking and the student has to receive. All the students will need to retrofit their expectations to the new realities which are emerging. But the transition from classroom teacher to guide and course monitors may not be easy, but that is what is required in time to come. Now, it does not work, again, if the education supply chain is not in sync with the market requirements. So the content that we teach, the content we, that we expect the student to learn must be closely connected with the industry in time to come. So what does the industry need is the next. Uh, so the future of work uh, will, uh, there are some certain underlying drivers that we have to be looking at. The uh, economic structure, uh, the labor displacement, and the emerging landscape because of the uh, changes that are happening within the industry, which we'll look at in some time to come. And on the other side, we have connectivity, we have machine capabilities, we have demographics, we have social expectations, the modularization, globalization, productivity, and so on. 
There is also a concept of remote work, uh, which means the skills that I require for a remote working also must be there. In, and all the skills that I require in order to fit into an employment market of the future must come from the university, must come from the institutions. And therefore, we must actually know what are those skills that we require. The hard skills, the soft skills, and employment. Now, this slide actually tells you it maps the entire echo space of what is required in future in terms of employment versus the what happens in the, within the university. Now there is a rise in uh, tech integrated courses designed to impart employability skills for the digital age. Let's look at what kind of skills we require and what, how the university must transform itself. Uh, there are uh, several honing, uh, you know, honing technical skills goes much beyond the IT industry. And therefore there are several sectors uh, within the uh, employment sector and each sector needs a different set of uh, skills. And we must be uh, looking at all of them but something that binds all sectors is artificial intelligence in times to come machine learning blockchain these do not have any specific uh, uh, domain like it or whatever though they they owe their uh, their uh, origins to it and the developments that have taken place in within the computer science domain cloud analytics deep learning iot robotics these are all they they cut across sectors and they get into every single employability or uh, sector now there are uh, let's look at a few uh, brief briefly the kind of skills that we require today to may to count within the with in the industry you need uh, hot skills within the it industry which are called uh, which, which are like javascript rust pandas java full stack python cyber security blockchain, Docker, Azure ML, edge computing, data analytics, and so on. Within the business, within the business and IT skill uh, area, you need an enterprise asset management, you need customer care billing and portal uh, development as skills, which must come, obviously come from the, uh, you know, come from the university institutions. Within the engineering and construction sector, you need of management. Uh, you need building information, uh, you know, modeling, planning and scheduling, port and CPM. Within the financial sector, you need uh, core banking, corporate lending, collateral management, retail banking, corporate banking, enterprise risk management. Most of this, these have a very strong connect with the digitalization of the entire industry. And therefore, the skill sets must be acquired within the institutions and the universities. There are also soft skills that are required. Uh, besides all these uh, hard skills that I've talked about, complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, people management, coordinating with others, emotional intelligence, so and, and several other skills. Now, I have a, I have a slide here which ma actually maps my uh, you know, essential uh, skill map for a digital uh, transformation. There are uh, for engineering, for data science, for product, for finance, for marketing, for managers, business skills, the tech skills, and the data skills. Now, this is extremely useful in terms of understanding how the university and the institution must mold itself into creating these new skills that are required and so on. Uh, like I said, future jobs will require new skills. The new skills can be in green tech, data and AI, cloud computing, sales, marketing, care economy. Healthcare is an, another area that's growing rapidly. Now, in this pandemic, the low-skilled jobs are very uh, they are hit the hardest. If you look at the accommodation, food service, the retail service, the construction, transportation, health, uh, your uh, government services. They are the hardest hit uh, in terms of uh, the low skilled uh, jobs that are required. So, therefore, reskilling and upskilling is extremely important in times to come. These other uh, the colored uh, you know, circles that you see, they succinctly tell you uh, how the market is uh, growing. There is a job requiring uh, which requires graduate degree, there's a job that requires mid level skills. 
and uh, the low skilled jobs now in future undergrad undergrad management student takes digital marketing courses probably from a reputed university in terms of digital marketing skills connects with the top industry partner like a facebook or google cloud goes through guided projects with most of the uh, service providers they give you uh, and uh, they also allow you skill uh, to go to skill uh, set for uh, uh, jobs and career success and uh, they also allow you pathways to do uh, further education and so on within the industry 4.0 skills that we are talking about let's look briefly at what what is this industry 4.0 uh, business all about uh, this one slide simply tells us how fast the world is moving today an internet minute in 2020 means 1.3 million logins every single minute and and so on there are the, the netflix the 7 lakh 64000 hours are watched uh, you know in a single internet minute 2.5 million snaps are created every single internet minute so this gives you the expanse of the spread of uh, digital digitalization that we're talking about the digital uh, around the world in terms of in, in a different uh, concept they, they we have uh, 56% uh, urbanization uh, and uh, you know unique uh, mobile uh, users uh, we have 67% penetration there is a 57 which has actually grown in in india it has become 80% today the internet users active social media users is about 45% mobile and social media users is about 42% and kpmg has an interested interesting uh, definition for 4.0 which says full integration of information and communication technology and the automation technology in the factories of the future now we must uh, understand what what is this uh, industry 4.0 in a very uh, in in a very, a very brief uh, understanding on one side you have all communicating devices which are connected together on the other side you have products processes autonomous uh, agents and digital networking and between this what connects is the labor 4.0 and the uh, skills that you require for digital digitized services for smart products smart factories and so on in an industry 4.0 scenario you will have machines talking to machines in the earlier stages we had people talking to people then we have people talking to machines and today we have machines talking to machines and a completely automated setup in an industry 4.0 scenario now it affects every single aspect of a value chain of a supply chain and uh, therefore you look you can look at this uh, slide enterprise resource uh, planning to asset management to sensors actuators global communications engineering design anything you talk about in the value chain the industry 4.0 will affect that and there are several smart products that are created which which is the outcome of such a uh, 4.0 enterprise we have lighting which you can control through your mobile you can have implanted digital glucose meters you can have uh, you know shirts which you wear which are wearable devices which are smart to capture all your uh, ca you know uh, human uh, body conditions and so on <clears throat> so we have a uh, rise in blended learning environment so we have to talk about personalized learning we have automation in education we have which i have talked about several administrative load uh, can be a lot of administrative load can be shifted to uh, you know automation and uh, the learning platforms that we uh, use there is an immersive learning experience uh, because of the ar vr uh, tools that we uh, use and therefore the entire uh, space the education learning space is changing gamification like i said the entire uh, content is uh, designed in terms of uh, like you play games uh, you create smart learning environments which uses iot uh, as a as a means to provide the inputs and uh, so on and of course you have emerging technology trends which uh, use ai big data machine learning wearable devices and so on 
Now, the, as far as the university is concerned, there is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, best of breed uh, concept in a university. You may have several uh, applications running, something for uh, accounts, something for student, uh, uh, you know, data, something for digital marketing and so on. And therefore, you may be using the best of uh, them in each of those sectors. Who will integrate them? Tomorrow you will have learning management systems, or you will content management systems, so on. So therefore, the concept of a managed service provider must come into the universities. Typically, we are moving into universities of future. So the organizational structures must change. The business model must change. The role of examinations must change. The no fixed degree programs, like I said, in, uh, said before, must happen. Accelerate uh, the uh, education cycles must accelerate, which means fast learners must be provided for. If somebody can complete a BTEC program in three years, it must be allowed. If somebody can uh, needs ten years, it must be allowed. And uh, new teaching concepts, uh, like I said, uh, will come in. Now, digital rights management is an extremely important uh, factor. Uh, in a digital world, what rights do I do? A student does a student have? What rights does the faculty have? what the rights does the management have and so on personalized become important and uh, new learning infrastructure will be required so this move we are moving into the domain of a digitized uh, university or university of the future so finally we come to what is called a virtual university and uh, a simple perspective is opportunity for overcoming the limitations of traditional learning large distance time, budget, and busy programs, expensive learning, and so on. Equal opportunities is something that will be allowed. Nobody will know who is learning, who is, what is caste or creed or religion or whatever. Nobody will be bothered about that. So typically, equal opportunity system will set in. New consortia of educational institutions, which means institutions will start collaborating. Why should I invest in the same thing that another, that another university is also investing in. Can we collaborate? Can we create content collaboratively? You use, we will use the best of your faculty and my faculty, collaborate together, create content, and put it on a platform and share the revenue. Now, whether you like or not, these things will continue, will happen in time in the uh, future. Now, this is the target audience for a virtual university. You have students, you have entrepreneurs, you have engineers, you have technologists in new markets, you have technology leaders, you have creators of platforms, ecosystems. Every single entity will become a part of a virtual university. And in future times, all these concepts will have to be tied up in terms of hybrid learning. And therefore, we will need new labs to come in, code labs where people will be allowed to freely code, pop-up studios where we, people will be allowed to create content, experiment, add value, and so on, cloud innovation labs, gaming garages, which use AR, VR devices, market space where a lot of tools are available, hard tools, soft tools, in order to students to explore their ideas and create experiential learning paradigms and so on. Innovative venture development centers, startups, ecosystems, entrepreneurships, robo rides, AI parks, everything will become a part of university system. And if you have to survive in times to come, these are the things that you will have to do. The, so what is the future? So full-fledged online programs leading to certificate, diploma, degree will become a reality. Intelligent mix and match of online modules aligned to value-added courses for industry professionals, that becomes a reality. Targeted specialized courses. I mean, somebody may want to learn music. Is it possible online? So these are targeted specialized courses, customer-built certificate, diploma degrees, blended learning, and complete assessment and quality assurance plan. Uh, so therefore, we, but having looked at all that very briefly, there is, there is all that I have talked about needs a certain clientele, a certain technology, a certain understanding, a certain value proposition, and so on. But do we have that? There is a digital divide that we have to look at. 30 million students in schools and 32 million in college are affected by COVID-19. We have been recommended online teaching, but there is a digital divide with embedded gender and class divide to boot. 
there are several reports i have mentioned all those reports here which uh, for example only 23.8% of households have internet access rural households there is even less and uh, there are males and uh, males are the primary users so women have even lesser uh, you know interaction with uh, you know, internet and so on young people have even lesser than that uh, you know 12.5 and students have access to smartphones and so on. So this is a digital divide that we have to address. Both the government and the private sector has to come into to address this uh, digital divide. Uh, so the curriculum will have to be reoriented to uh, to get the best out of the digitalization that we digitization that we are talking about. So the curriculum will have to be reoriented, and uh, there must be a social and political consciousness. By students, and that should be a major goal of education. And the lessons of quality, equality, and core democratic values must become a part of learning. Because all that we are trying to do is democratize education, not make it an elite uh, activity or uh, something that is directed towards the lesser. Uh, you know, so we need to empower a wider cadre of teachers a different breed of teachers will be required not those who are trained in traditional methods like classroom teaching where i teach and where i speak and you listen that kind of things will have to go so there are a different class of teachers will have to be uh, coming in and and, and so on uh, continuing education and uh, lifelong learning they will become uh, the uh, you know, units of the future in terms of learning now all those slides that you have seen i have used several references this is a list of references that i have uh, used uh, for those who are who want to learn a little more about what i have said uh, as a recap i have spoken about the pandemic and the road ahead i have spoken to you about something about industry 4.0 skills the labor skills that in order to fit industry 4.0 you need labor 4.0 skills, you need blended learning, learning management systems, what is a future university, what is a virtual university, and so on. So you within your university, you can look at each of these parameters that I've shown in this slide in order to figure out where you stand in terms of the technology and in terms of usage of that, and in terms of the way forward. Uh, so this is call to action, uh, this is a slide from your perspective. and. Uh, it's a quotes together what I have been speaking uh, It just says, Yukti Yuktam Prakrohoni Yat Bala the Pimchakshanaha, Rave Ravishakyam, Vastukim Nadipa Prakashigate. Uh, what it means is, why should learn to accept wisdom from anybody? Distance learning will teach us this. We should accept wisdom from anybody, even from a child. Doesn't the small night lamp light up things which the sun cannot? So this is the con concept uh, that we must uh, look at in time in future. And you know, uh, coordinate, and uh, that that's what I have uh, today to share with you. And uh, uh, I return back uh, the control. Thank you so much. So would you? Um answer a few questions um, yeah, sure, sure, sure. yes yeah. there are a few questions from our faculty staff and ma'am please continue yes sir thank you uh, sir uh, raju chandrasekhar sir is asking from bangalore that how the foreign universities are coping up with these online exams issues particularly the uk universities that offer their online programs in india and all over the world See, most of the uh, successful stories are where learning management systems are effectively being used and have access to good online content. So if you, if uh, people can, and most of the universities, uh, whether uh, you're talking of uh, uh, the US or Europe or uh, even in our country, they are using uh, uh, a lot of uh, learning management systems. And they are also using uh, good content from uh, providers like Udemy or uh, edX or Coursera and so on. And they also uh, build a certain kind of interactivity with, the, with their own professors and uh, try and reach out to the students in terms of uh, 
better understanding the online content uh, so it's more, it's more like uh, blending the online content with the uh, with a professor actually coming online uh, at certain uh, times of time uh, certain periods of time uh, in order to uh, you know better explain if there are points of uh, uh, difficulties and uh, understanding so that's what is happening in most of the universities the examination systems people have very oriented to uh, assessing uh, students on on continuous basis and also on uh, uh, in a short uh, uh, objective based uh, questions which address uh, smaller units of a learning uh, you know uh, learning uh, uh, requirement that uh, one has so it's not Uh, typically like uh, i teach for uh, 30 hours and then hold an examination it doesn't happen like that i teach for maybe 1 hour and hold an exam go through uh, several uh, questions which bring out the understanding of concepts and so the story goes on like that so most of the universities have made that great and in future i i believe every single university uh, will have to either collaborate with others or we'll have to work out similar uh, things to get across to their uh, students thank you sir now another question is from bhuvan jain and he is asking sir that you are as you have spoken about the establishing an emotional connect with the learners yes Could you throw some light that how can be achieved consistently See, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult uh, uh, proposition anyway the problem is um, we are dealing with asynchronous learning where the uh, learner and the instructor or the content is uh, does not have any direct uh, connect and there are several of them on the other side and therefore the emotional connect will come in with the kind of questions that are raised and with the kind of replies that are made uh, by the mentor the facilitator there is a group of people who handhold the students it's not it's again not uh, one to one between the faculty on one side interacting with the student on the other side having who has gone through a, maybe a, a 15 uh, minute uh, module so it's not like that so there are there is a group there are a group of people who pick up questions on a chat session and they bring in uh, additional material to uh, you know if it is available the sources of uh, the additional material and so on and it's purely the ability of the of the of these three people the faculty the connected faculty the mentor the facilitator all of them coming together to create a environment of uh, learning and interest from a student's perspective so uh, the emotional connect uh, really happens in, in that fashion tomorrow if i have to return back to the uh, to the learning uh, module and learn the next 15 minutes at least the first 15 minutes should be interesting enough for me uh, to uh, you know to think of coming back so gamification helps uh, trying to uh, use uh, models and uh, uh, create experiential learning uh, uh, you know methodologies all all those things uh, really help thank you sir so the question is uh, from a student and uh, prashant he is asking that from the point of students what is the scope of online degree as compared to regular course no personally i i uh, there are still regulations coming uh, on that uh, behalf uh, people are uh, going through an traditional online uh, program which people used to call it uh, many years back as uh, you know what is a distance uh, program where content was uh, uh, you know posted and people used to learn from that att- attend a few classes and so on we are moved out from that uh, time but however within the universities the student who learns from outside the system outside a college also goes through the same examination system so in terms of uh, assessment he goes through the same assessment as a uh, face to face uh, student 
so therefore uh, there is there is a debate saying that what what is the difference and there are also concerns like uh, if you have to uh, figure out uh, if you have to insist that a face to face student attends uh, 75 80% of the classes this guy who doesn't attend a college comes Uh, through a different system, attempts the same paper and probably clears it, and both get the same degrees. So these are all debatable points. But over a period of time, what has happened is we have moved out the moved out from that phase and created very good online content, online material that is available, e-books which are available, interactive sessions which are available. So therefore, there is nothing left uh, as a typical distance uh, learning mode. now these online modes they also use learning management systems that i have spoken about and therefore they create a real connect between the student and the uh, and the learning uh, platform so therefore in times to come there will be hardly any difference between how you learn as long as the competency based skills exist so the assessment becomes much more important in and not so much as how you what mode you used to learn them so therefore eventually that the uh, if there if at all there is any difference uh, between an online degree and a face to face degree that will uh, collapse in uh, times to come and as a, as a uh, as an educator i would uh, certainly like that to happen thank you sir so uh, another question is from dr aprajita Uh, she is saying sir i have a question about gamification as i did try to include that but i am not able to master the correct fusion of learning assessment versus task completion no my my suggestion would be uh, you will have to really under uh, uh, look at uh, uh, studying educational technology and the different pedagogies which are used uh, in order to get across to students there are different type of learners and therefore each learner would expect a certain way of uh, learning so that he gets the best out of uh, what is being taught so therefore uh, it's it's a, a experimental area and the way games are designed you will need to really understand the logic behind designing a game the algorithms which are used to design a, a particular game and can we really come back and use them uh, into creating content which uses some of those uh, features of uh, games now the idea here is in a uh, the from a from a purely teacher learner student based learning we are moved out uh, into a uh, guide and mentor and uh, someone else has a content someone else is explaining someone is learning there is no connect between these people and and so on so different paradigms are actually happening uh, in in this space so uh, so uh, it is really uh, necessary to understand what is what are the pedagogies what what is the andragogy that is uh, around uh, this paradigm then whether uh, cybergogy has any uh, basis on this whether pedagogy has a basis on this the directed learning that uh, people are talking about i mean going to a uh, you know a search uh, site and trying to figure out what to learn and how to learn and, and so on so the concepts of education technology become very important and the psychology between the teacher and the learner needs to be better understood in terms of designing the content so that's where the game the gamification part uh, really helps thank you sir sir this is the second last question uh, by professor lena dam and she is asking that how uh, sir, that kindly share the tips and how to develop emotional connect while designing e content probably i won't be able to uh, give you a very simple answer uh, here but uh, i would uh, suggest that we can certainly have another session uh, where uh, i'll take you through a complete uh, you know process of uh, creating out using uh, tools for gamification and how to achieve some amount of connect with the users and so on of course sir thank you sir the last uh, veena bhalla ma'am is saying that there is no question as you have explained it so well So thank you sir for this session <laughs> she has attended thank this thank you so much you yeah
Lovely. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, sir, uh, for removing your valuable and precious time for uh, guiding us through this uh, digital momentum and the change that the world is going through especially in this coronavirus period. And then suddenly we had a lot of uh, faculties who had to turn their, uh, I mean, who had to be so adaptable to new technologies. And the guide that you provided today with your presentation was such a, I mean, it was, it was amazing to see your in-depth analysis of each section. And it will really guide us uh, for developing our digital content for the betterment of our students. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And we hope we can connect again with our next topic. That is that is the one that you said that is connecting the emotional content, connect in our content and the tools that can be used. Uh, thank you. We surely connect for that, sir. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. We'll connect soon, sir. Thank you.